Good morning, Anchor family. Thank you for being here with us today. If this is your first time with us, we'd love for you to fill out a digital connect card. That can be found at theanchor.me. Fill it out. We just want to get to know you better. If you're watching us in the local area, we want to invite you to come out to our corporate prayer services. These happen weekly on Wednesday evenings from 5 to 6 p.m. in our sanctuary. Come out and let's stand together in prayer as we make a difference. Next, we just want to say thanks so much again for your continued giving. Now we say it week after week, but it truly makes a difference. Your giving makes it possible for us to continue to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to the whole world. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for being with us. Let's jump in. Lord, as we get into your presence this morning and give you praise, Lord, let your joy fill us. Lord, let your joy fill homes this morning, fill hearts and fill lives, God. As we praise you, you're worthy. Come on, sing it out. Jesus, Jesus, there is nothing like your presence. I will sing of all your goodness. For all my fears fade to praise. Savior, there is nothing like your freedom. Dancing with the hope of heaven. For all my fears fade to Lord, beyond what our own words can convey. 
thank you for your joy, Jesus. Come on, just let his joy fill your hearts right now in this place. God, your presence brings it, and Lord, we just receive it this morning, Father. In your presence, Lord, in your presence there is fullness of joy. And Lord, where you are, God, is where we want to be. Lord, just continue to let his praises rise in your hearts. Sing this out. away, always faithful, always loving. Jesus, I love you. Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Want you see that?
morning, y'all. Listen, in, in light of everything that's been going on, and I should say in spite of everything that's been going on, I hope everyone in here had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, it's certainly good to be back in church and see all you guys here today. So let me kind of uh, take a moment, kind of set up where we're going here. Um, over the past few days, I've had a few people just encourage me to say, hey, uh, you know, have you thought about sticking with that subject of contentment? And to be honest with you, I've kind of prayed over the past few days and I haven't really felt some, uh, you know, leading or inclination from the Lord to go in any other direction. And so uh, we're going to stay in that same direction today. I kind of dove in a little deeper and I just kind of want to share some things with you that I found. I believe it'll probably connect home with most of us in this room. So uh, before we before we start, let me kind of prerequisite with this. There's going to be a few things today that I'm going to reiterate and I want you to know from last week and I want you to know that this is intentional okay and the reason it's intentional is for the sake of consistency but also uh, because I know we're humans and a lot of times we'll come to church God will talk to us he'll speak to us and uh, we go out those doors and we get caught up in life because life is busy right and, uh, you know, what God said to us, we kind of lose it in the clutter of everything else. And so sometimes it's good to kind of hear something again or pieces again. And so my hope is today that it'll stir up some things in a good way so we can grow in the areas that God wants us to grow. Amen? Amen. Amen. So listen, we're going to begin today by uh, reading Philippians chapter 4 again. But I want to say this. Um, theologians have described this book, the book of Philippians, as the book that basically is Paul's thank you letter to the church that was in that city. In other words, if you you actually go read chapters 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, all the way up to chapter 4, verse 10, which we're about to read, uh, we can actually see Paul repeatedly thanking them for their consistent care, their consistent love, and financial support to basically him for a number of years. And so, kind of with that in mind, that this heart of gratitude, uh, let's pick it up in verse 10. Paul said this, he said, How I praise the Lord that you, talking about the church in Philippi, are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Once again, there's the thank you. But I want you to notice that in the middle of all these gushing remarks of how grateful he is, he kind of turns on the dime and he drops a nugget in the middle of this that I believe that actually challenges every one of us to this day. And here's the nugget. It says in verse 11, it says, Not that I was ever in need. Like, can you imagine, I'll just pause there for a second. Can you imagine just saying those few words? Not that I was ever in need. Like, I've never met anybody that actually said that, right? And then, and then he goes on, he says, For I have learned how to be content, or I have learned to be satisfied, fulfilled, or at peace with whatever I have. He says, I know how to live on almost anything or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or if it's on an empty stomach, with plenty or little. And then he says, just keep verse that most of us know, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And just like that, it's like he drops the nugget and he picks back up his thank you letter and he says in verse 14, even so you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, it's almost as if Paul dropped that nugget so quickly, if you weren't paying attention, you would have missed it. And maybe that's why so many of us in the church, including myself, has you know, extracted verse 13 from that portion of Scripture and, and in many ways used it incorrectly, right? But, but I want you to know today, so we can kind of move forward with the right proper context from this day forward in this passage of Scripture, the point that Paul was actually trying to make, uh, not just to the church of Philippi, but to every one of us is this is that he had personally learned that through Christ he could be content in any situation that he found himself in. Now, obviously, like we talked about last week, that seems like a pretty big deal, realizing that Paul actually wrote this probably from prison. But I actually want to pull in another verse from 2 Corinthians today to kind of bring more uh, context, more, uh, you know, of a thought process of what Paul really meant when he said that I've learned to be content in all situations. So if you can, look at this verse with me, starting off in, in chapter 11, verse 23. He says, Then I say they serve Christ. And then he says, I have worked harder, been put in jail more often. I have to stop there. Paul's the first person I ever met, uh, met or heard of that actually bragged about going to jail more often than others. <laughs> Anyways, just free thought. He says, being whipped times without number and faced death again and again and again. He says, five different times the Jews gave me their terrible 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once that he literally was physically drifting in open sea all night and the whole next day. 
Then he says, I have traveled many weary miles and have been often in great danger from flooded rivers and from robbers and from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the hands of the Gentiles. Then he said, I have faced grave dangers from mobs in the cities and from death in the deserts and in the stormy seas and from men who claim to be brothers in Christ but are not. He says, I have lived with weariness and pain and sleepless nights. Often I have been hungry and thirsty and have gone without food. Often I have shivered with cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the constant worry. In other words, if that wasn't enough, then I have the constant worry of how all the churches that I planted, how they're getting along. Like, did you get all of that? Like, did you hear all of that, right? It's like, once again, take, you know, what we read there in Philippians, Philippians 4, and I think sometimes it's easy. Yeah, I've been hungry too, Paul. Big deal. All right? But when we pull all of that into it, man, I think that takes those words, be content in all things, uh, to a completely different level. Am I the only one in here today? Like, wow, right? Now, obviously, I can't speak for anyone else in this room, but I can tell you this. When this old southern boy from Alabama, right, when he begins to stop long enough and actually begins to think about all the difficulties that Paul endured for the sake of the gospel, I want you to know it causes me to seriously reevaluate some of the things that I have defined, defined as difficult. Right? Like, in fact, I'm sitting here wondering that just maybe, just maybe that this guy hasn't, uh, you know, basically hasn't had quite as much to complain and whine about as he once thought. Now, I'm going to step out on a limb here and, and maybe just assume that when you heard all of those things, that just maybe that some of you came to the same conclusion as well. Now, here's kind of the point that I want to make here, okay? Because when, and I know we don't supposed to compare, but when we're kind of evaluating here, then I just think this, man, if we can walk away with this understanding that when we actually begin to gain a proper perspective of our lives, man, it's a powerful or it's a helpful thing. Can I get an amen? Yeah, amen. So with that in mind, I want, to, I want to share a thought with you here, and we'll kind of get running here. But, but I want you to know that while on one hand, when I read everything that Paul went through, I'm a bit embarrassed personally to confess that I still struggle with a lack of contentment in the areas that I struggle in. Amen. Okay? But I'll say this. On the other hand, when I read that, there's a word that I found there that, that encouraged me greatly. And it was the word this. It was this word. It was the word learned. Yep. Like, did you notice back in Philippians chapter 4 how Paul said that he had learned how to be content? And he said that he had learned the secret of living, what, in every situation. You see, if we realize it or not, that word, uh, that one word learn tells us this, that in spite of how incredible we think Paul was, right, and, and as much as we respect him even to this day for who he's been in the kingdom, that he clearly did not start out being content with the things that he went through. Yeah. That's encouraging, right? Meaning that he obviously struggled just like you, just like me, at some point in his life with a lack of contentment, which in turn tells us this, what? That we are in good company. Yes. But it also tells us this, please don't miss this. It tells us that if Paul didn't remain in a place of a lack of contentment, then that means I don't have to remain and you don't have to remain in a place of lack of contentment for the rest of your life either. Because we can learn something. Amen? So, listen, I may not know exactly what Paul's particular struggles were, but I do know this, that I haven't met a person in all my years of living that, that doesn't fall into the if-only trap every now and then. And here's what I mean by that. And, and as soon as I say it, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I've been there myself. But, but this is actually the if-only trap is where we begin to inwardly tell ourselves things like this. We say, if only I had a better paying job. I would feel better about my finances. If only I were in a relationship, I wouldn't feel so lonely, right? If only my children would learn to listen better, I could be a better parent. <laughs> Can all the parents just say amen on that one for a minute, right? Listen, if only my spouse would pitch in more around the house, then I wouldn't feel so overwhelmed, right? If only, right, if only I was with someone else other than my spouse, <laughs> then I would be happy, Maybe if I had a, a nicer teacher, I would make better grades. If only my, you know, my boss was better, then I would enjoy my job more, right? If only my friends were, if only my husband was, if only my wife was, if only my church was, right? Like, keep on going. If only, if only, if only, right? And whatever your blank is of if only this could be different, then what we're saying is, is then I could be content. You know, for some reason, I don't know why, but man, the reality is that so many of us struggle with the, the grass is greener on the other side of the hill mentality. Yep. I know I do. 
right? And, and here's what's crazy. When I begin to think about all those if onlys, uh, you know, over the last few days, I realize something that every time we fall into that trap and, and we keep saying inwardly and sometimes outwardly, if only, if only, if only, what we're really saying is this, man, if only everything was really about me, then I would be satisfied in my life. Like if the world would get a clue that everything is about me, then I could be satisfied, I could be content, and I could be at peace. But somebody, somebody uh, do me a favor, please. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's not about you. <laughs> Here's what I love in those moments. Listen, like, like if you're sitting beside your spouse, I realize everybody's not. But in the back of your head, you're probably thinking, I've been trying to tell you that for years, right? <laughs> yes. All right, so let's shift gears here really quick, okay? Be because I actually want to share with you uh, three reasons. I'm sure there's more, but I want to give you three reasons why living an if-only life is so unhealthy. Why? Three reasons why living an if-only life is so unhealthy. Now, the first reason is super obvious. We talk about it truthfully quite a bit around here, uh, but it's simply this. When we start living from an if-only life, we have a tendency, number one, a tendency to blame everything and everyone for the reason we are not content in our current situation. See, it doesn't take rocket science, guys, to realize that the reason this is so unhealthy is because if we are constantly blaming everyone else for our lack of contentment, then we will rarely, if ever, take personal responsibility for the part we are playing in the issue. Right? And you see, it's without that self-awareness, we will fall into a pattern. I've seen many people here, and I've even done it myself. We fall into a pattern of making excuses for our wrong motives, our wrong intentions, our wrong attitudes, our wrong words, and our wrong behavior. We always excuse ourselves and blame the other person. But we need self-awareness, and we need to begin to own things. Right? So watch this. So on the flip side, can you imagine how different our lives would be if we would actually learn that our feelings of content, discontentment, I said this last week, once again, that they don't come from people around us or from circumstances we're in. Rather, our lack of contentment is really a, a condition or an issue of our hearts. Yeah. And if I can put it plainly, it really reveals our lack of maturity in the Lord. Yeah. Like literally, like every time if I would stop and go, man, this is where I am struggling. The truth is, is there's typically an identity issue there for me. Right? Like there's an area that I need to grow in. There's an insecurity that's there. There's a jealousy that's there. There's envy that's there. There's something that's there that's causing me to be, uh, to, to lack contentment. And typically the reason is, is once again, because I need to grow in an area. I need more maturity in the area in the Lord than what I have. Am I making sense to y'all? So let, let me kind of give you a verse here that I think if we would grab a hold of, then maybe all these feelings would disappear. It would help them disappear. Psalms 34.10 says this. It says, But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. What do I mean by that? Now I mean this, that if we would just believe that, then maybe that God's given us what we need, then maybe I wouldn't be uh, jealous and envious and maybe I wouldn't be so discontent with everything. Yeah. But I'd understand that God's given me. He's provided for me. He is Jehovah Jireh. Yeah. Am I making sense to y'all? Yes. So secondly here, when we start living from an if-only life, we actually have the tendency to make poor decisions. We have a tendency to make poor decisions. Thursday I sat at my house and, you know, everybody was eating, doing their thing, and, and, uh, and I began to mentally make a list of through the Bible where I think people connected with this point. And, and I want to just go down a list. You can look at it. We'll throw it up there. And there's Bible references that are connected with every one of these. But if you can, walk the dog with me here. So we have Lucifer, who obviously is the archangel. He rebelled against God. Why? Because he wanted to be what? The Most High. We have Adam and Eve, right? They disobeyed. They ate from the tree, right? Because they wanted to be, the Bible says in Genesis 3, like God. We know Cain killed his brother Abel. We know Sarah got impatient and convinced her husband Abraham to sleep with her maidservant Hagar. We know that Lot's wife looked back and turned to a pillar of salt. That Esau sold his birthright to his brother Jacob. That Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. That Moses got ahead of God and he killed the Egyptian. Right? That Aaron fashioned a golden calf for the people to worship. That Korah wanted to be Moses' equal. So God did what? He caused the ground to open up and he swallowed Korah, his family, his friends. 
friends, they all went, right? You can read there's a progression actually in that story. Then obviously you have Achan. He took what wasn't rightfully his and he hid it under a tent. We know Samson told Delilah his secret about his hair. David committed adultery with Bathsheba. David's son Amnon uh, raped his half-sister. David's son Absalom tried to take his dad's throne. Uh, David's son Solomon married many foreign women, causing his heart to turn from the Lord. Fast forward to the New Testament. You got King Herod, right? What did he do? He murdered all the children under two years old in Bethlehem. Why? Because he felt threatened by a baby. You got the rich young ruler who walked away from Jesus, what was sorrow in his heart. We had John and James who came to Jesus, said, we want to be greater than the other disciples. We know Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, that Peter chopped an ear off, right? Do we know that John Mark left the mission field and went home? Last one, that Damas, uh, that he forsook Paul, which was ultimately he forsook God. Because why? Because he loved the things of the world. So listen, there's many more examples we could use in the Bible. But here's the point I'm trying to make is that when we actually stop and consider what was the common denominator, the common denominator of everybody we just talked about between all those people, it isn't that they just messed up. The common denominator is this, is that they weren't content. They weren't content with what they had, where they were and who they were. So what did they do? They made poor decisions. And all I'm saying today is, listen, is we shouldn't think that we are incapable of doing the same thing. So here's a takeaway, I guess, really from this point. It's just like the people on that list. Obviously, we're not going to try to overthrow God. Some of those things are pretty major there. But, but it's just the point of this is that when we lack contentment, we typically make poor decisions that carry undesirable results. Please don't miss that last part. When we lack contentment, we typically make poor decisions that carry undesirable results. That's why the Bible says, guess what, guys? You reap what you sow in the positive and the negative. We all know that there's always a cause and a what? An effect. So here's, here's where we typically make these poor decisions, okay? And we could spend weeks on this, but we only have a short window. So I'm going to throw some blurbs at you, man. If it hits, just grab a hold of it, okay? But we typically make poor decisions because we're discontent in a few areas. First one is this, is we make mistakes relationally. And what I mean by that is we begin to compromise and we align our hearts with people who don't share the same values we do. Yeah. Right? Next one is this, is we make mistakes romantically. Now, it depends on where you're at in the stage of life that that affects you. Obviously, more single people make those mistakes, but married people can make it as well. What happens is we get lonely. We feel like our needs are not getting met. And, we, and what do we do? We, we don't wait on God. We don't let God fix things. And so we settle or we make poor decisions, right? The next place we make decisions off of or bad decisions off of is professionally. In other words, we try to accomplish everything on our own. We go, well, you know, things aren't moving the way I want them to, so I start working to pieces, right? I start doing it all. The next piece, and this is a huge one, is this, is financially. Like, financially. Like, if I, if I, could, go, if I could go to hear to hear really quick for you, it's like when, when, when Christians aren't content, they either do two things. They refuse to give, Okay? They refuse to trust God and tithe and give offerings and be givers. Okay? Or they go to the complete other side and what they do is it's not really about the church. It's that everybody at Walmart knows them by name. Amazon knows their credit card. You, you know, whatever. They just go spend, 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 spend. And the last area where we say, well, we really make mistakes when we lack contentment, when we're not settled in our own heart is this, is we make it spiritually. Now, I could run into about 100 different areas right there, but there's, there's one thing I, wanna, I feel like I need to hone in on. And, and once again, if the shoe fits, wear it, okay? But it's this, is that we either try to do this. We either try because we lack contentment. We try to become more than who God's called us to be, right? And convince everybody of that. Or we do the complete opposite, and we go and we hide our gifts, and we hide who God has called us to be. Yeah. So listen, let me, let me just say this, okay? Because there's no judgment in any of that. The truth is, is, is every person in this room can identify somewhere in there where you've made a mistake, including this guy. So there's no judgment. We've all done it. It's just trying to get us to recognize why we did what we did. Yeah. It really boiled down to we didn't have contentment in our hearts. Right? So let me, give you, let me give you a verse to connect with each one of them. So if you wrote those down, you can write a verse out beside it. But the first one is this, relationally. 1 Corinthians says this. God said, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. 
Bad company corrupts good character. And listen, you know, for years in youth ministry, I would quote, in my opinion, one of the best youth pastors that's ever lived, Jenny Mayo. She used to say this to a group of hundreds of kids that were in her youth group. She would say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Okay, and I just think this, if we can realize it doesn't matter if we're 15 years old or if we're 55 years old, yeah. show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Because right. who you surround yourself with is who you'll become like. That's right. Amen. That's why I personally like surrounding myself with people who want Jesus. Yeah. I like being around people who when they leave my house, it makes me want to go pray. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's who I enjoy being around. So listen, Isaiah 54, next one, romantically. This is where patience comes in because it says, for your maker is your husband. Right? Like he's your spouse. Right? The Lord Almighty is his name. I'm going to say this. I haven't said this in any service, and I don't know why I'm saying it, but I'm, going to, I'm just going to go. Trust that's Jesus. I, I, re, I remember when I was um, 19 years old. I actually remember I was at a campground. We were at our ministry's uh, basically opening orientation retreat. And I remember being out there praying, and I was, and I was complaining to the Lord about not, uh, not having someone, like wanting to get married. I'm like, I'm 19. I only have a job, right? Uh, I'm in school, right? So it's like funny, like not even prepared. Anyway, so I remember telling the Lord, I, I said this, I said, I said, uh, Jesus was never even married. How does he even, like literally, like he never even felt this. And man, it was like the, the light came on and I realized that we are the bride of Christ. And, he, and I heard him say with some oomph behind it, Quentin, I've been waiting over 2,000 years for my bride. And so what is the first, uh, you know, the first characteristic of love in chapter 13, 1 Corinthians? Love is patient. So to understand that there's a place of contentment, understanding if you're single, if God wants you to be single at the time, that you go, you know what, I, I need to just trust the Lord there that he can be my husband or he can be my wife for this season until God blesses me with someone. Amen? Amen? Yes. So the next one there, professionally, Psalms 127, one says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. I just think when I get to heaven one day, I don't want to bring a bunch of wood, hay, and stubble. Right? I want to have gold and precious jewels. I want, to, I want to do it because God was doing it. Right? The next one is financially. Grab a hold of this verse, please. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Right? It doesn't mean that we don't position ourselves and work and so do all those things. But, but the, the revelation here is this, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Like how often have we quoted that scripture Right? And totally with the fact that, you know, he was talking about money behind it and being content with what you have, right? That's why he said, he said, you can be content because I won't leave you. Amen? Amen. Next one is this. When we talk about how God has wired us, right? If we, if we don't like how God has wired us uh, by either we wish we had some other kind of gifts or maybe we're sitting back, you know, we're not content in that or maybe we're sitting there going, you know what? I, I wish God wouldn't have gave me these things because I don't want to use them, right? Whichever one you're in. Listen to this verse. Romans 9 says this. It says, but who do you think you are to second guess God? It says, who, or sorry, how could a human being Molded out of clay, say to the one who molded him, why in the world did you make me this way? <sighs> yeah? So, so with this idea of contentment, what I want to do for a second before we move to our next point, I actually want to, I actually want to tell you a story, and some of you guys have maybe heard, heard, maybe heard me say it before, but I want to tell you where I learned a really valuable lesson in this area of my life. And so I'm going to go all the way back 22 years ago when I moved from uh, a nice comfortable spot that I had in an incredible church in Birmingham, Alabama, and, and I went to, basically God told me to move to Lafayette, Louisiana, and I moved to Lafayette, Louisiana the week I turned 20, and when I got there, guess what, guys? I wasn't just in a, in a new state, but I was in a new culture. In other words, just as much of a culture shock that I had when I moved to Maine, I had that actually when I moved to Louisiana. And the reason is, is because uh, the food was different. The weather was different. Man, the, the terrain was different. The houses were different. Man, like, literally everything was different. If it wasn't hot, you didn't eat it. 
Okay? So, so listen, so it was a, yes, it was a new state, new culture, but it was also a new church. I was under new church leadership. Uh, there was even a new uh, ministry philosophy or a different philosophy in the church than what I was used to. And then there was surrounded, because I knew two people in the entire state, I was surrounded by new people that I didn't click with, right? And I was living with a new family because the church leadership said, here, you can go live with them. And I, they put me in a house that was a mess, right? And so I was sitting there with this new family and I had this new routine because I had to ride with the guy that, that owned the house and he always left the house like 5.30 in the morning. Well, I wasn't accustomed to that, <laughs> right? And so my point is this, is that all these things were new and how many of you know when you're, when you're surrounded by that much new stuff, you get snatched out of your comfort zone pretty quick. Yep. And when you get snatched out of your comfort zone, something begins to happen. It's called discontentment, wow. right? And so what happened is, is, is I got to a point where I was like, man, I was breaking. I was so lonely and man, I was so depressed. And one night I said, you know what? I'm going to wait till everybody leaves the church and I'm going to go to the church. It was probably about nine, 10 o'clock at night. And I went to church for your, because I had a great acoustic so you could worship in there. And uh, even with a guy like me, I sounded good. So anyway, so listen, I began to worship Jesus. And I began to pour out my heart to God. And I began to pray for a lack of better words. I began to give God my, uh, my three if onlys. Like, God, if you'll do these things, then, God, I'll be content. I can make it here, right? And so here I am having this moment. I'm snotting, crying. And I began to ask the Lord. The first thing I said, Lord, would you please give me a spiritual father? And I named a few guys that I admired and a few young men that were connected with them. And I said, God, like that, can you give me someone, please? Please just give me somebody to love me. Please give somebody, you know, give me somebody to help me develop and grow in the things that I feel like you've called me to do. And all I heard from the Lord was Psalm 68, 5, where he said this. He said, Quentin, I'm the father to the fatherless. So then I began to go to my next if only. And I said, God, if you could somehow just give me friends. God, I had these guys when I lived in Birmingham. I moved down here. Man, I'm so lonely. Could you please just give me a friend? Please, God. And I heard the Lord speak to me out of Proverbs 18, 24, where he literally said, Quentin, he said, what? I'm the friend that sits closer than a brother. And then I decided to get brave and ask the Lord the last if only. I said, Lord, can you at least please give me a girlfriend? <laughs> Come on, don't play. Don't act like you don't have those feelings, right? And so I said, Lord, please, right? I said, I, you know, I had, I had this girlfriend when I was back in Birmingham. We're no longer together. Maybe somehow if you give me a girlfriend who filled this void in my life. And I heard the Lord. He took it up a notch. The first two were really sweet voices. This next one had some up on it. And he simply said this. He said, Quentin, until you learn how to romance me, you have no right romancing a woman. Wow. Now, please hear me today because I'm going to shoot straight with you, Okay. None of those things, like none of that is what I wanted to hear. Have you ever been there? Have you ever went to prayer and God spoke to you? And you're like, ah, not what I wanted, right? So listen, it was not what I wanted to hear, but it was exactly what I needed to hear. And the reason was, is because this is because it may, it may have not changed my situation, but what it did change was my trajectory for the future, and sometimes I wish we as believers would understand that, guess what, that God isn't so concerned as much about our current situation, our emotions, and our feelings as we think He is, but we would understand that, you know, He's more concerned with the trajectory of where we're going. Yes. Right? Because there's this idea, and I've told you before, that God knows where He's leading us. He knows what we need and who we need to be when we get there. And so He's working, and so we have to trust Him. Yep. Amen? So, so here was like, it's like I look back and I'm like, man, really the lesson that God was teaching me that night was this, is that if I didn't learn how to be content with him and no one else, right, that guess what would happen? That in my life, if I couldn't be content in him, I would never really be satisfied, fulfilled, or at peace in this life. But if I got that with him, then it didn't matter what I would go through, I'd be okay. And the cool part about this is this, is that if I can somehow fast forward from that nine and a four year crying my eyes out here from Jesus, fast forward 20 years, 22 years to where we're at today. The cool part is I can look back and I can realize that, you know what, that literally every, every major turn along the way, you know what, I never made the wrong decision. Like I'm confident in that. Does that mean I've always made the right decision in the little things? No, but you know, not even close. But I am confident that in the big things, guess what? That I actually learned from that moment that I didn't base those decisions off my lack of contentment. Right. I didn't let my emotions get the best of me. But I could actually sit in difficult situations. And I've been there when everything in me was screaming, run, run, run. And I never heard from God. So I just sit and I waited and I died. Yep. Right? Right? 
Because there's that part, side note, didn't say it in other services, but there's that part of you that, man, that if you want to really experience the life of God, you got to be willing to die so he can resurrect what needs to be resurrected. So often we just try to redecorate the tomb and keep the dead things alive. <laughs> right? But if we would let Jesus actually kill the things inside of us that he wants to kill and let him resurrect what he wants to resurrect, man, we'll be in a better off spot. Amen? Amen. 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 Lastly, number three, when we start living from an if-only life, we have a tendency to stall out spiritually. We have a tendency to stall out spiritually. And let me explain to you how this happens. In fact, I want to kind of give it to you this way. I'm about to give you a list of things, okay? And I know I'm giving you a lot of like little things today. Uh, but the truth is, is this list we're going to look at, I actually want us to see it that this is how God views the discontentment in our hearts. In other words, we think, you know, we get so consumed with us and we say, here's how I feel. And I want you to realize maybe how God feels. Fair enough? Can you throw the next list up? I think it's this, that discontentment is really, the way he sees it, discontentment is a lack of trust in him. Like I said, like, like you don't trust me? Right? Discontentment amounts to what? Us complaining against his plan. That discontentment exhibits a desire. In other words, we're telling God, God, I'd rather be in control because you're not doing a good enough job. That discontentment wants something that he hasn't given us. Like I realize in life, y'all listen to me, please. It's like in this life, if we stop and think about it for a moment, that maybe God has given us what he's given us because that's what he can really trust us with. And the reason he hasn't given us more is because he really can't trust us with it. Like I know that to be true about myself. Because I know, I know where my pride can go. Am I being too honest? So it's this part, the discontentment, that even says this, that it suggests that God has been making a mistake. Like, God, do you realize that you've made a mistake of why I'm at where I'm at? And then lastly, because there's that underlying theme there, that discontentment actually begins to exalt our wisdom above God's wisdom. That we think we're smarter than he is. So with all that said, the question I have for us is this, is with this third point. When all of that yucky stuff right there, with all of that stuff is clouding our mind and clouding our heart, it's all in our emotions and that's all we're thinking about. Like literally if we stop, do we actually think that for a moment that we can move forward in the will of God in our lives without contentment? Like, how are we really going to move forward in God if we're not content? Now, now, listen, you may disagree with me on this, and it's fine, but I just think this. I honestly believe that God doesn't reward wrong thinking, bad behavior, and poor decisions. Like, I don't think He does. And so, when you look at all of that, man, that's wrong thinking, yeah. right? And that produces bad behavior, and it produces poor decisions. So why would we ever think God's going to reward us, help us move forward, much less give us promotion somehow in life if that's where we're at? Yeah? Like, listen, if there's any good parent in this room, I promise you in your life, you didn't reward your children uh, when they had wrong thinking and bad behavior and poor decisions. Right. I'm not saying that after they did those things, you didn't extend grace and mercy, because thankfully God does, yes. right? But I'm saying is, is we didn't reward them. Yay! <laughs> right? You did that again. God bless you. Here's you a hundred bucks. Go get it again. Right? It's stupid. Okay? So, so let, me, let me maybe say this, and um, just to give you a personal example. Um, bef basically, about, about six months before we moved to Maine, um, and I've told you guys this before too, but just to bring it into this context here. I, you know, I had known for, for two and a half years that we were going to make a transition where we were at to another place. I just didn't know where that other place was, right? And, and I didn't know when it was going to happen. I just knew it was going to happen. And, and so this actually may be a year before. And, and one day I was praying because we were in a spot and, uh, and truthfully, I was struggling with some things in the ministry we worked in, okay? And, and I'll just leave it at that. I was struggling, and, and I had a bad attitude, and I was listening to people who had a bad attitude, and I was spreading a bad attitude. I, I wasn't using my influence well. Uh, I thought I was, but clearly I wasn't because the way God rebuked me. But, but one day I was, I was just praying, and I saw 
uh, this reference, Psalms 37. And I was like, I don't have a clue what Psalm 37 says. Let me go look. And it goes and it basically talks about how the Lord will give you the desires of your heart and all these things. And I, I'm just trying to cut it short. But there's this one part in the NIV that says this, it says, do good in the land. And I knew the Lord was saying this, Quentin, I've put these things in your heart, but your attitude stinks so bad I can't release it to you. That's good motivation. <laughs> So I said, okay, let me kind of fix my attitude. Was I perfect? No, I wasn't perfect. Sometimes I blew it. But man, there was a major adjustment in here, right, Con you know, pertaining to all those things. And truthfully, I just kind of made the adjustment, try to keep a good attitude with the people I need to have a good attitude with, and, uh, and try to have a servant's heart, and try to fix all the things. And I, and I started not listening to other people, as, you know, that, that were talking. And, and what I did was, is I just kind of went about my business and tried to honor Jesus. And, and fast forward, you know, months later, we came for the interview. And the morning that I was waking up and I was praying and I went outside. We were actually staying with these guys over here. And I was outside in their backyard. Brian was working on something, some machine. And, and, I, and I was praying in the yard. And um, anyways, so I came back inside the house. I was standing in the bathroom and I was getting ready. And I saw Psalm 37. I didn't know what it said. <laughs> Forgot. And I opened it, I looked at it, and I began to read it, and I realized the Lord said, you know what? He brought me full circle. Because you did this, now I can release you in this. So going back to the point of going, man, when we lack contentment, we can actually stall out ourselves spiritually. That I'm telling you, that's an example of how God was wanting to bring promotion in my life. But literally my attitude was putting a dam to it and holding it up. Instead, it took my heart to get right so God could do what he wanted to do. Yeah. Am I making sense, you guys? So let's just say this, and we'll, we'll land this thing. I just think if we learn how to be content and not live life from the if onlys, it means that we will do these things. If you can rewind that list there, it means we'll have a tendency, if we, have, if we learn, we'll have a tendency to take responsibility. We'll have a tendency to make good decisions more often than not. And lastly, we'll have a tendency to grow spiritually. Now, how do we learn? Okay, watch this. Can you throw up that last list, please? Yeah, watch this. Let's reverse this. What happens if I actually learn to trust God? That I learn to stop complaining against God's plan except accepting God's plan? If I begin to actually exhibit a desire to trust His sovereignty and His control in my life? What happens if I actually begin to say, you know what, Lord, I believe that you've given me what I can handle and what I can be trusted with, right? And then even understand this, that man, that God, I realize and I recognize you didn't make a mistake. I'm trying to give you some great prayer points here. And then the next one is this. We begin to go, you know what, God, I trust not in my wisdom, but your wisdom. Your ways are really higher than my ways. Right? right? That if I can begin to live those li a life like that, it doesn't mean every day I'm going to wake up great. But I think if I do that more often than not consistent enough, I begin to reprogram some ways I do things and I'll begin to learn how to be content and learn to trust God. Yes. Yes. I'm making sense, you guys. Yes. So let me bring a balancing statement here and we'll pray. I just think this, um, the balance of this is you have to know the Bible well enough to recognize what is of God and what's not of God. Because we do have an enemy that wants to bring things in our lives. That's right. Right? And if I think that everything that comes in my life is of God, then my life is going to be a mess. Yes. Okay? Remember what we said last week. God's still giving you spiritual authority. He's still giving you faith. He's still giving you the ability to pray. But you've got to discern what areas that you go, Lord, this is your will, and other areas that that's not God's will, and so I'm going to fight. Yes. Right? Like poverty is not of God. Sickness is not of God. Am I making sense? Okay, so you go things and you, you go down the line, you know what the Bible is, you know your covenant rights, and you fight where you need to fight, and you accept what you need to accept. Yes. Amen? Good. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today, God, that you said in your word that truly we could do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And Father, we realize today that that's not some, you know, Popeye spinach for the believer, that we can do whatever we want to in Christ. But Lord, we recognize today, God, that it's simply that we can stand and have strength through you to face any situations. And so, Lord, I just ask today, God, in the name of Jesus, for every person that's here today, that you would help them to discern in their own lives what is of you and what's not of you. God, that you would actually help each one of us today to stop and go, Lord, what is it that you're trying to do in our lives at this moment? 
What is the teacher trying to teach? What are you trying to uh, work in our hearts, work in our lives? How are you trying to build our character, God, in all these things? And so, Lord, we can really understand, once again, what to fight against and what to be content with. But, Lord, I just ask, God, for every one of us today that you would come and you would teach us. You would help us learn what it means to be content in all situations. Because, Lord, we want to be a people, God, that, that, that literally that takes responsibility. We want to be people, God, who are literally uh, growing. We want to be people. People, God, who are, who are literally just doing what you called us to do and all the things that get in the way and hinder us, we don't want any of that. We don't want to live in the if-onlys. We want to live in the possible and what's possible with you. And so, Lord, we just ask today that you would come and open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, God, and give us revelation of these things. And, Lord, we just simply say to you today, God, that we're yours. Whatever you want to do, we say yes to. God, we're willing to go the road that you want us to go. We don't want to be somebody we're not. We want to be who you called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.